and the internet was the way to finding your people. And of course, she had friends at school too, but never in the way she was supposed to, which apparently involved pajama parties and makeup and going to the mall. That didn't matter now. The future was here and up in the misty mountains. So Janelle is interested in what again, her mother asked, engineering. Stevie said, she makes things, machines, devices. A skeptical silence followed. And that Nate boy is a writer, her mother said. The Nate boy is a writer, Stevie confirmed. These were the two, these were the two other first years known to live in Stevie's new dorm. They didn't tell you about the second years. Again, this was information that had circulated around the Bell kitchen table for weeks. Janelle Franklin was from Chicago. She was a national student spokesperson for Growing Stems, a program that encouraged young girls of color to enter the field of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Stevie had gotten a lot of background. How Janelle had been caught successfully repairing the toaster oven when she was six years old. Stevie knew all of Janelle's likes, making machines and gadgets, ordering welding, old soldering, excuse me, and welding, uh, curating her Pinterest boards of organizational techniques, girls with glasses, YA novels, coffee, cats, and pretty much anything on television. Stevie and Janelle were already in regular text communications, so this was good. Friend one. The other first year in Minerva was Nate Fisher. Nate was less, no, Nate said less, excuse me, and never replied to text, but there was more to know about him. Nate published a book called The Moon Bright Cycles when he was 14, 700 pages of epic fantasy written over the course of a few months, first published online and then in book form. Moon Bright Book 2 was supposedly in the works. They were the kind of people Ellingham Academy accepted. They sound like very impressive people, her dad said. And you are too. We're proud. You know that. Stevie read the code in, in this sentence. Much as we love you, we have no idea why you, you, you have been accepted to this school. Strange child of ours. The entire summer had been like this. This weird mix of voiced pride and unvoiced doubt underpinned by confusion about how this series of events had happened at all. When she had first done it, Stevie's parents didn't know she had applied to Ellingham at all. Ellingham Academy wasn't the kind of place people like the Bells went to. For almost a century, the school had been home to creative geniuses, radical thinkers, and inventors. Ellingham had no application, no list of requirements, no instructions other than if you would like to be considered for Ellingham Academy, please get in touch. That was it. One sentence that drove every high-flying student frantic. What did they want? What were they looking for? This was like a riddle from a fantasy world or a fairy tale. Something the wizard makes you do before you're allowed to enter the secret of caves. Applications were supposed to be rigid lists of requirements and test scores and essays and recommendations and maybe a blood sample and a few bars from a popular musical, not Ellingham, just knock on the door, just knock on the door in a special, correct way they would not describe. You just had to get in touch with something. They looked for a spark. They saw such a spark in you. You could be one of the 50 students they took in each year. The program was only two years long, just the juniors and seniors of high school there were no tuition fees. If you got in, it's free. You just had to get in. The coach veered into the exit lane and pulled into another rest stop where one other family stood in wait. A girl and her parents studied their phones. The girl was extremely petite with long, dark hair. She has nice hair, Stevie's mom said. No, she wasn't talking about someone else. This was a reference to Stevie's hair which Stevie had cut herself in the bathroom in the early spring in a burst of self-renewal. Her mother had cried when she saw Stevie's blonde hair in the sink and had taken to her hairdresser to get it trimmed and shaped. The hair had been a major point of contention 
so much so that at one point her parents said she would not be allowed to go to Ellingham as a punishment, but they backed down in the end. The threat had been made in high emotion. Her mother had been very attached to Stevie's hair, which on some level was why it had to go. Mostly, though, Stevie just thought it would look better short. It did. The pixie cut suited her, and it was easy to care for. There were problems when she dyed it pink and blue and pink and blue, but now it was back to normal, dusty, blonde, and short. The girls' bangs were loaded into the bags, excuse me, were loaded into the bottom of the coach, and she and her family got in. The three of them were all dark-haired and studious-looking, with large eyes framed by glasses. They looked like a family of owls. Polite, mumbled hellos were exchanged, and the girl and her family took their seat beside the bells. Stevie recognized the girl from the first-year guide, but didn't remember her name. Her mother gave her a nudge. Stevie tried to ignore. The girl once again looked at her phone. Stevie! She took a long breath through her nose. This was going to require leaning over her mom and calling out to the girl who was a row beside on the opposite side. Awkward, but she was going to have to do it. Hey, Stevie said. The girl looked up. Hey, she said. I'm Stevie Bell. The girl blinked slowly, looking for information. Jermaine backed, she said. Nothing else was offered. Stevie started to lean back, feeling like this had been a good effort all around, but her mom nudged her again. Make friends, she whispered. Few words are more chilling when you put together than make friends. The command to pair bond sent ice water through Stevie's veins. She wanted falling rocks, but she knew she would. She knew what would happen if she didn't do the talking. Her parents would, and if her parents started, anything could happen. Did you come far? Stevie asked. No, Jermaine said, looking up from her phone. We came from Pennsylvania. Oh, Jermaine said. Stevie leaned back, looking at her mom and shrugged. She couldn't make Jermaine talk. Her mom gave her a well-you-tried look and points for effort. The coach juddered as it turned off the highway and onto a small, rockier, smaller road dotted with stores and farms and signs for skiing, glass blowing, and maple syrup candy. Then there were fewer buildings and more stretches of farmland with nothing but an old red truck and an occasional horse up and up into the woods. Out of nowhere, the coach made a sharp turn into an opening of trees, jerking Stevie to the side and almost tipping her out of the seat. Close to the ground, there was a small maroon sign with gold letters, the Effingham Academy entrance. It was so inconspicuous that it seemed like the school was deliberately hiding. The road they were now on was barely a road. It would be charitable to call it a path. What it was, in reality, was an artificial tear into the landscape, a meandering scar in the forest. At first, it went down very fast, pitching towards one of the streams that bounded the property. As the base, at the base, there was a construction that you could laughably refer to as a bridge that appeared to be made of wood, rope, and dreams. The sides were about a foot high and it looked like it could collapse if anything heavier than a steak dinner crossed it. The coach barreled over it. The bridge shook violently, rumbling Stevie's seat. Then they went up again, a gradient usually reserved for ski lifts and airplane takeoffs. Nothing would stop the coach. The shade from the tree darkened the path completely. The branches stretched at the sides of the vehicle like dozens of fingertips. The coach made a grinding noise and seemed to be fighting its way up the ever-narrowing path. Stevie knew that there was nothing to be afraid of, but the coach seemed to be working against the forces of the universe itself to make its way up this driveway. It was unlikely that this would be the trip. This would be the... this 
one with her and her parents that the coach would give way and barrel backwards the way it had come, running loose and wild, crashing blindly towards the river in sweet, cold, watery oblivion. But you never know. The ground started to level and trees gave way to a smoother path and an opening view of green lawns. The coach approached a gate guarded by two statues of winged creatures with smiling faces and empty eyes, four paws and tails. Those are strange angels, her mother said, craning to look. They're not angels, Stevie said. They're sphinxes. They're mythical creatures that you ask riddles before you're allowed to enter. Enter. If you get it wrong, they eat you, like they did to Epidus. The riddle of the Sphinx. That's a Sphinx. Not to be confused with Sphinx, which is a sidearm in the holster of the diet industry complex. Her mother gave her that look again. We kind of wanted to go out shopping, prom going type, and we got this weird creepy one, and we love it, but what is it talking about ever? Sometimes, Stevie felt bad for her parents. Their idea of what constituted interesting was so limited. They were never going to have as much fun as she did. Germaine peered over at Stevie with large, luminous eyes. Her expression was unreadable at the Sphinxes. In that moment, a blanket of doubt dropped over everything in Stevie's mind. She should not have been admitted. The letter came to the wrong house, the wrong Stevie. It was a trick, a joke, a cosmic mistake. None of this can be real, but it was too late. And even if all of those things are true, because they had arrived at Ellingham Academy. So it definitely had some funny points. Um, Shrouded with mystery seems um, pretty appropriate. Uh, I am definitely going to be finishing this one. Um, I hope you all are doing well. I hope you enjoyed uh, your first chapter Friday. I know this one was a little bit longer than normal, but um, hopefully it was interesting. Um, don't forget that you can download ebooks through a number of different uh, choices. I have sent out emails that list some of those resources, and I am updating them daily as I get new information and new resources for you to be able to use. Um, if you have any questions, please reach out. Uh, I will be doing another one of these next week. Um, now that we have been, um, our quarantine has been extended for another month, um, I will continue doing our South Carolina Young Adult Book Award nominees books. Um, I hope you all are doing well. Again, reach out if you need anything. And um, I appreciate you watching. Thanks, guys.